podcast are perfect. So to everyone uh, watching in Milwaukee, you know, welcome. We're glad to have you here. You know, even though you know we can't see you, we're glad that you're able to be here with us. Um, yeah, so you can see it appears we've all found our our comfy spots here. Um, it's you know, I'm on the west coast, so it's about 6.30 in the morning, my time. So I am on the opposite end of the house from where the bedrooms are. Yeah, <laughs> don't wanna, don't wanna wake anyone up. <laughs> and welcome to our panel, um, Peace and Justice Narratives in the Shadow of COVID-19, where we're um, engaging that sort of theme of narrative from really three different angles. Um, unfortunately, uh, Kadeem Gale, who is going to share some of his poetry with us, um, he can't be here for um, health reasons. So he's resting up, taking care of his health, and you know, our thoughts are with him. But we're going to to press on. So to uh, start with, we have the Reverend Dr. Uh, Kirk Johnson. And let's see now, I believe last I knew you were um, with uh, Protestant Campus Ministries at Rutgers, is that right? Oh, correct. Uh, but in the capacity uh, for this conference, I am representing um, Montclair State University, where I am assistant professor of justice studies and medical humanities, which oh, we'll talk it. afterwards. But we'll talk um, afterwards. That is yes, that so. capacity that I am um, working um, right now. So uh, thank you, Gabe. Um, and of course, um, my colleague as well, uh, Dr. Kira Whitehead. So mm -hmm. um, my particular uh, paper will be on. Um, for the next, I believe, uh, 15 to 20 minutes will be on um, COVID-19, racial fear, and biological misappropriations towards Asian Americans, a particular topic that we have uh, seen, unfortunately, unfold um, recently uh, due to um, racism and its connections with medicine. So a little background, according to the World Health Organization, on December 19, 2019, Wuhan Municipal Health Commission in China reported a cluster of cases of pneumonia, at least that was classified at the time, in Wuhan, Hubei, Providence. A novel coronavirus was eventually identified as COVID-19. COVID-19 received this name from past coronaviruses. Coronaviruses can cause, quote, the common cold, as well as the dangerous illnesses such as severe acute respiratory syndrome, known as SARS for short, and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, known as MERS for short. SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus first discovered in December 2019, caused a disease now known as COVID-19, and the many, many variants that we um, are hearing throughout um, that have been developed throughout the course of the past uh, year and a half or so. The virus quickly spread on a global scale. According to the World Health Organization, COVID-19 has infected, infected tens of millions of individuals and counting and led to fatality, fatalities in the millions. Since the Spanish flu of 1918, our global community has not experienced such an epidemiological event. The COVID-19 pandemic has indeed left an unprecedented mark on our global community. One of the countries that has the worst consequences from COVID-19 is, of course, the United States of America. On January 21st, 2020, the Center of Disease Controls and Prevention, known as the CDC for short, confirmed the first case in the USA. It was a man from Washington State in his 30s who had returned from Wuhan, China, just a week earlier on January 15th, 2020. At that point, there was a concern that the disease possibly spread throughout the country. Since that first case, the Center of Disease Control and Prevention reports the USA has 
tens of millions of confirmed cases and fatalities that increased by at least six figures. And now we have fatalities of over 700,000, unfortunately, which uh, plateaued uh, this past uh, couple weeks. Unfortunately, COVID-19 continues. It will further change our global society. However, COVID-19 was not the only illness that swept through America. The lingering epidemic of racism continues to infiltrate American society. What has not changed are understandings of race and its problematic ties to illness. Similar understandings have impacted our other racial and ethnic groups as well, African-Americans and Latinx communities. However, my focus here will be on Asian and Pacific Islanders in the discipline of race and illness. During the pandemic, President, former President Trump statements have reignited ideas that race is a proxy or explanation for the cause of COVID-19. Such ideologies of race are being used incorrectly to blame Asian Americans for the spread of COVID-19 in America. Before we review the 45th United States president's statements, it is necessary to explore the origins of race and illness ideology. These connections are rooted in the American eugenics movement. In my um, previous book, Medical Stigmata, Race, Medicine, and Pursuit of Theological Liberation, I mentioned eugenics was influenced by French biologist Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, and of course, the infamous Charles Darwin. Francis Galton, Charles Darwin's cousin, created the words eugenics. There were two schools of eugenics, positive eugenics and negative eugenics. The school of positive eugenics asserted human breeding should be controlled to produce genetically superior human beings. And the school of negative eugenics asserted that the improvement of humanity can only happen by eliminating or excluding genetically inferior human beings. Positive and negative eugenics were implemented in America through Charles B. Davenport. Charles B. Davenport, the father of the American eugenics movement, established and directed what he called the eugenics record office. Davenport redefined eugenics as, quote, the science of improvement of the human race by better breeding, end quote. To accomplish eugenics, he said, we simply apply science to the problems of a class-ridden and socially heterogeneous society, end quote. Eugenic influences like Irvin Fisher, founder of the American Eugenic Society, Margaret Sanger, founder of the, of the Planned Parenthood movement, Alfred Plotz, founder of German eugenics, Eugen Fischer, a German eugenic anthropologist, and Fritz Lenz, a German race hygienist, were all exclusively self-identified as white, Anglo-Saxon, Nordic, or Caucasian, stressing the idea of their racial superiority. Davenport established and directed the Eugenic Records Office with Harry H. Laughlin as superintendent. Davenport's racial classifications, which created the first official American categorization of races, determined the school you went to, what cemetery you were buried in, where you lived, your fertility control, and who you married, which created the first official American categorization of races. Specifically, Davenport influenced the United States Office of Management and Budget, otherwise known as the OMB. The OMB constructed the racial and ethnic categories used to collect, organize, and analyze a country's demographic data. Davenport's work, which combined his classification of race, combined with his interest in what is now known as Mendelism, suggested that race not only determined intellectual ability, but also determine human ailments and diseases. His findings were based on his inheritance and canary study, which influenced the idea of disease and intelligence being associated or connected to certain racial groups like Asians and specific Islanders. Davenport categorized Asians and I quote, genetically unfit or inferior because they were less intelligent, primal and disease written. End quote. These are understandings of what is classified or described as 
social medical race, racialism. Dr. David McBride described social medical racialism as, quote, the idea of diseases were classified and attributed to certain races, end quote. Through eugenics justification, diseases and illnesses associated with certain racial groups should be treated because not only the disease affected that specific group, but it affected the entire society. Eugenic influence created social and racial classifications through pathology that included ideas of Asians. For example, journalist Iris Chang, author of The Chinese in America, A Narrative Story, wrote a New York Times article titled, Fear of SARS, Fear of Strangers, mentioned that in 1875, the American Medical Association sponsored a study to investigate assertions that Chinese women were, women were spreading a unique Chinese strain of syphilis. Though the study found no evidence to support the claim, one medical publication called the Medical Literary Journal nevertheless accused the Chinese of, quote, infusing a poison in the Anglo-Saxon blood, end quote. Also, Dr. Chang mentioned the Santa Cruz Sentinel in 1879, described the Chinese as half human, half devil, rat eating, rage wearing, low ignoring, Christian civilization hating, opium smoking, labor degrading, entrail sucking, sensuals, end quote. Dr. Chang's assertion had a historical basis because eugenic ideologies created as previously mentioned, social and racial classifications through pathology, through disease, which also influence immigration policies. The United States Congress passed the first major federal immigration law restricting entries in the United States called the infamous Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The Chinese Exclusion Act set the tone about race and ethnicity in 20th century immigration policy. This particular policy targeted the Chinese and prevented them from seeking opportunity in America. According to Dr. Sarah M. Griffith, Associate Professor of History at Queens University of Charlotte and author of The Fight for Asian American Civil Rights, Liberal Protestant Activism, 1900 to 1950, mentions, and I quote, Americans often compared Chinese labor to African-American chattel slavery. The term coolie slave, quote unquote, came into frequent use in the national debates over Chinese immigration and nativist organizations used the term to mobilize patriotic memory and moral indignation of absolutionism in order to protect and empower white labor, end quote. Eugenicists believe that immigrant entry should be no later than the year 1890 because most of the populations will be genetically undesirable. This was known as, quote, the yellow peril, end quote, or the fear that the Chinese and other Asian Pacific Islander immigrants were a social and pathological threat to American and Western culture. Due to the bubonic plague, the eugenic ideologies of immigration and illness strengthened in the late 19th century. According to the Journal of History of Medicine and Allied Sciences, the bubonic plague started in the early 1890s in southwest China, then along trade routes from Hong Kong to Canton. In 1899, the bubonic plague broke out in Honolulu, Hawaii, affecting whites and Chinese. However, the Hawaiian Board of Education placed the Chinese under quarantine, prevented them from sailing to the U.S., and burnt down parts of Honolulu, Honolulu's Chinatown. Throughout the early processes of drafting immigration legislation, eugenic ideas of race and illness significantly influenced immigration law. For example, Dr. Nayan Shai, a professor of American studies in ethnicity mm -hmm. and history at the University of Southern California and author of Contagious Divides, Epidemics and Race in San Francisco's Chinatown stated, and I quote, in 1900, there was a bubonic plague outbreak in San Francisco. A doctor first identified the disease in a resident of Chinatown, which led to the quarantine of Chinese Americans and immigrants in the district. Yet tellingly, no one quarantined white people 
who had recently been to Chinatown. Surgeon General at the time, Walter Weinman, the US Surgeon General at the time, Walter Weinman, described it as a, quote, oriental disease peculiar to rice eaters, end quote. In addition to Dr. Shah's work, officials in San Francisco closed Chinatown businesses, forced Chinese residents to submit to inoculation, and cordoned off the neighborhood with a nine foot tall fence. These actions were later ruled unconstitutional. In 1910, whoops, excuse me. In 1910, there was a new immigration center in Asian Island in San Francisco Bay, California. Officials claimed that the physical isolation would stop the epidemics which were prevalent among aliens from Oriental countries. At Angel Island, healthy and sick Chinese immigrants were together in close quarters, regardless of no critical care facilities. On Angel Island hospitals in San Francisco refused to admit Chinese patients. A detainee who had cerebral spinal meningitis was isolated in a tent until he died. In 1913, California, the state of California, passed the first in a series of alien land laws that denied immigrants ineligibility to citizenship, particularly targeting Asian and Pacific Islanders. It was the first generation Chinese and Japanese who were denied the right to purchase or own land in California and limited land leases, leases uh, uh, to uh, three years. Five years later, medical malfeasance or medical harm and scapegoating continued with the Spanish flu. In 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic killed up to 50 million people worldwide. The name itself suggested eugenic arguments that link immigrants with disease. For example, the cholera outbreak was called the Asiatic or Asian cholera because it was first detected in India, even though it was also flourished in European countries like Britain. In 1922, the United States Supreme Court ruled on the case of Toa Ozawa versus US. Ozawa was, was born in Japan and migrated to the USA. He was denied US citizenship based on, quote, the naturalization law of 1790, which determined only free white persons were eligible for naturalization towards citizenship. According to the court, white meant Caucasian and the Japanese were thereby ethno ethnologically disqualified. In 1924, the Johnson Reed Immigration Act passed, which provided a national origins quota system, allowing 2% of the nationality's population with Asia being completely excluded. So you see race was constructed to include those who were accepted as white and excluded everyone else. American eugenic ideology sustained a pathological and monolithic stigma of the Asian and specific Islander identity. The racial branding of illness was first used to describe the Chinese since the 1957 to 1958 flu pandemic that was identified in China became known as the Asian flu. And in 1968 to 1969, flu pandemic first identified in Hong Kong became known as the Hong Kong flu. The physical, virtual, and verbal abuse was not exclusive to Chinese individuals, but all Asian individuals and specific Islander individuals who fit the physical and facial aesthetics of Chinese individuals were assaulted. Because the racial label of Asian falsely encapsulate an entire group of people. As Dr. Kijo Choi, chair and associate professor of religion department at Seton Hall University asserts, what it means to be Asian American cannot simply be neatly contained within certain defined cultural parameters. While deeply embedded popular cultural attitudes may assume certain values, practices and events as inherently Asian American, while others are to say Italian American or African American, even though all persons can appreciate and celebrate their respective cultures, these familiar cultural markers hardly capture or define the fullness of plurality of Asian American identity. One person's way of being Asian American may not be necessarily the same as others, uh, uh, as another's. That is the truism of sorts. After all, no one is in a clone of another whether Asian or non-Asian, end quote. 
So racial labels dilute the diversity of cultural identities, struggles, triumphs, and histories. They bring the false assumptions that a group of people that possess similar physical traits behave, think, and interact in a homogenous way. It also reifies xenophobic fears that any societal problem is caused by, quote unquote, the other, meaning Asian Americans in this context. This was accomplished through legislature, laws, policy, and language. In the past 10 years, the same politically and linguistically informed psychology of race and illness was prevalent. Fast forward to our current particular century, in 2009 to 2010, the H1N1 flu, if we all can remember, was first recorded in the US. It did not become the American flu, but it was called the swine flu because scientists at first thought it was like the viruses that occurred in North American pigs. Currently, we know that more extensive testing has complicated this theory. The H1N1 media coverage reported it may have come from Mexico, which bolstered immigration fears. As for smallpox, it had originally come to, America, to the Americas through European invasion. Together with other new infectious diseases, smallpox killed millions of Native Americans, also known as the first Americans. More recently, New York City was one of the most infected places by COVID-19, not just in the US, but globally. globally. Yet most COVID-19 cases in New York City did not come from China, but it came from Europe. Geneticist Harm von Bakel at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai and a separate team at New York University, Grossman School of Medicine, analyzed genomes from coronaviruses taken from New Yorkers. Both medical schools came to the, the same conclusions. Despite studying a different groups of cases, oddly enough, when there are cases and events when diseases or viruses are linked to white individuals, there was no blame and backlash. Based on American eugenic history, when whites feel insecure and threatened, they can feel more powerful by blaming and victimizing others. To note, the individuals who physically, virtually, or verbally attack Chinese and Asian Americans blaming them for COVID-19 are not all white. However, violent responses induced by racial fear was, repeating, was a repeating pattern by whites in US history and continuing in the 21st century. So to fast forward, um, to finish up in a couple of minutes I have left because I am mindful of time, let's fast forward to what actually has happened and the consequences of COVID-19. So on March 16th, 2020, there was a post or tweet on the social media platform, Twitter, that broadcasted, quote, the United States will be powerfully supported those, supported those industries like airlines and others that are particularly affected by, quote, Chinese virus. We will be stronger than ever before, end quote. This instance was the first time that COVID-19 was called the Chinese virus. The tweet was made by the former US president, President Donald Trump. Consequently, his tweets elicited many responses. Trump's statement can be interpreted as a political response due to the wavering relationship between the Trump administration and the Chinese government. After President Trump's remarks on March 18, 2020, Texas Senator John Corrin said that China was to blame for the spread of COVID-19 because they are, quote, a culture where people eat bats, snakes, and dogs, and things like that, end quote. And Secretary of State Mike Pompeo labeled the pandemic, quote, the Wuhan virus. As you can imagine, there were a lot of particular consequences. Literally in the same month of March, 2020, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Investigation warned of white supremacists and anti-Asian hate crimes during the pandemic and notified state and local law enforcement agencies to be on heightened alert. Based on these two federal agencies' urgent warnings, President Trump and Senator Corrin's responses were racial epithets that threatened the lives of Asian Americans. Furthermore, their language enabled physical, verbal, and virtual racial attacks by insinuating connections between Asian Americans, specific islanders, and the COVID-19 spread. To conclude, we have to be mindful of our histories, not only social 
but also our pathological histories and not scapegoat particular, excuse me, and not scapegoat particular groups of individuals. However, we have to understand that COVID-19 does not discriminate. It doesn't, the virus doesn't care what you look like, who you are, or your political affi affi affiliation. We have to be mindful that COVID-19 is a virus and we need to do everything in our power to get rid of stigma, get rid of racism, but also protect ourselves, our families, and of course, our fellow man and community. Thank oh. you. Thanks, Kirk. Thank you for giving us that, I guess we could say historical narrative about the history of um, anti-Asian narratives leading up to COVID-19. I think your ability to take a contemporary issue and put it in its both bioethical and historical context is really valuable. Um, so, so that's the, the first of our sort of three narrative angles on this COVID-19 pandemic. And for the uh, second one, we're turning to Dr. Kira Whitehead, who's an English lecturer at Wenzhou Kane University, Wenzhou, China. Um, who I believe is going to be talking some about her narrative peace building pedagogy and how that was affected by the pandemic. So I'll turn it over to you, Kira. Thank you, Gabe. Um, and thank you, Kirk, for this very timely study. Um, so essentially, I'll, I'll be speaking from kind of a different angle here um, where I'll, I'll be sharing some of my personal teaching experiences in light of the pandemic and, and online instruction as a result. Um, so I'm looking at the impact of, of online teaching on narrative peace building pedagogy. Uh, so I've spent, the, uh, I've spent the last five years working for Wenzhou Kane University or WKU uh, China, prior to which I taught at Kane University USA. Um, Wanzhou King University is a Chinese American run institution, which was established in Wanzhou, China by Kane University, New Jersey in uh, 2011. Um, so WKU offers a number of majors, including English, computer science, uh, graphic design, finance, accounting, marketing, global business and architecture. Um, students successfully completing their studies earn degrees from Kane University. Uh, all students have the option to choose an English name and are required to complete coursework under the English Immersion Program in preparation for their major coursework taught solely in English um, and for prospective employment opportunities uh, after graduation. Now, WKU prepares students for graduate school in the workforce to function as global citizens once they leave campus. And all students are required to study basic English courses in their first year of study and are required to continue to st the study of English in later years. Now, from 2018 on, um, I've acted as WKU's English for Academic Purposes or EAP specialist for graphic design. Um, now at the outset under this title, I was working strictly in the English department, teaching English as a second language or ESL um, under the College of Liberal Arts, creating materials for English and design instructors, classroom use and kind of acting as a liaison between the departments. Now, since students will likely use their English language skills in a global setting, I wanted my course materials to utilize the English language as a vector for peaceful dialogue. 
Uh, so for several years, I've also aligned my research on peace building pedagogy with my own classroom curriculum and the materials I've been creating for my EAP work, using the ESL classroom as kind of a microcosm for, for peace building. Um, and in so doing, and specifically for my ESL classes, I built lesson plans designed to facilitate peace building in the ESL classroom through storytelling, um, utilizing literature and the arts. I then sort of bridged a connection between my peace building pedagogy for ESL and my EAP work for design, um, extending my peace building research to design students as well. Uh, in some ways, this was a seamless connection to make as design is considered storytelling. Um, and as a result, I requested and was approved to teach strictly design students for all of my ESL classes. Now, because of the work I was doing with the design students, I then joined the design department under the same role as EAP specialist in 2019. So rather than working under the English department now, I've been teaching design classes under the design department, um, geared toward enhancing students' design-specific English skills. So again, as much of my research has been on peace building pedagogy specific to the ESL classroom and to the arts, I then combine that research with design pedagogy for my EAP work and design classroom curriculum. Uh, I then integrated the materials I created through my EAP work into the classes I've been teaching in the design department, which also further developed the work I've been doing as EAP specialist. Um, so in other words, since working in the design department, I've begun to use the design classroom um, in place of the English classroom as kind of a laboratory for adapting and expanding my peace building pedagogy research uh, while merging it with my EAP work and design class curriculum. Uh, however, the, the pandemic altered these plans further when my curriculum was put to the test in an online platform, of course. Uh, so originally, as mentioned, when teaching and integrating peace building, building pedagogy in the, the English department, I was really focused specifically on storytelling through literature and the arts. Um, in this interdisciplinary literature and the arts-based classroom, I encourage students to kind of weave a world of connections for themselves where culture and community develop a uh, deeper meaning and become defined by relationship through communication and comparisons. Um, now, my classes encourage cultural and self-expression through a student-centered method um, while acknowledging common cultural misconceptions that occur in the classroom. Um, I sought to encourage ways of establishing relationship in the classroom while recognizing the inhibitors of intercultural connection and, and communication as well. Um, my intention was that through intercultural understanding and student autonomy, uh, the classroom would kind of prepare students for global leadership after leaving WKU. Um, now in my ESL classes, students engaged in a number of literature and arts-based activities to facilitate interaction. So they wrote poetry, letters, songs, film scripts, um, creative fiction, nonfiction. They acted, sang, danced, um, listened to folk tales from around the world and, and shared stories and learned about other cultures and lifestyles. Uh, as, of course, learning a second language also means learning about people's concerns, attitudes, feelings, um, challenges. So the classroom became a space where students could share their stories, experiences, and future concerns through a number of creative mediums um, to partly determine the diversity that can be expected in navigating a global lifestyle. Uh, so as the English language and therefore ESL courses continue to expand globally, there's a growing need for cultivating cultural competence and communication in the college level ESL classroom. Um, however, my EAP work has presented kind of a unique opportunity 
to extend this channel of communication to the globally influential field of design. Um, so once I began kind of merging my ESL curriculum with my, my EAP work and teaching in the, the design department, I utilized similar activities to encourage effective, constructive, and peaceful communication through design. Um, now, design is communication and, and innovation is a, a key quality in any effective design. So utilizing the course to, to encourage broad-minded autonomous learners uh, turned out to be kind of a natural transition from my ESL courses. However, uh, given that my courses are inherently hands-on and interactive, the pandemic certainly posed its challenges in then adapting those materials to an online setting. Um, though in the same token, the pandemic also posed an opportunity for considering the ways in which designers can respond to global crisis. Um, so when news first started coming out about the severity of the virus, I was home in the US for, for winter break, um, preparing my intro and Intro to Design and Visual Culture course to be taught in the spring of 2020. Um, this course introduces design as a creative medium. It's essentially an investigation into the global and influential role design holds in shaping identities of the, the world's cultures and lifestyles. Um, throughout the semester, we explore advertising design, architecture, graphic design, industrial design, and, and interior design. Um, and at that time, of course, I was preparing to teach face-to-face, -face, like many of us. Um, it wasn't until nearly the end of our, our break that WKU decided to go online for, for spring semester. Um, leaving our instructors, like many others around the world, scrambling to begin navigating the online setting. Um, so we had a week to complete a Blackboard training course and work with a course designer to adapt and upload all of our materials online. Um, so alongside completing the Blackboard training, I began adapting my materials to suit the online setting, um, yet realized that there was now an opportunity and kind of another element here to be integrated into my course. And that is the designer's role in responding to global crisis. Um, hence the, the underlying question throughout our semester kind of became, what is the designer's role in response to global crisis? And how can that response help to facilitate peace building? Uh, so the first challenge was to determine how to adapt these materials created for a student-centered interactive environment to an online setting. Um, and the second was to encourage students to consider the, the pandemic, this added layer of our course, um, in its relation to global design and visual culture. Uh, so several, several questions came to mind before, throughout, and at the end of the, the semester. Um, at the outset of the semester, I thought about the potential benefits of online instruction for an unconventional peace building model specific to design and, and English language. Um, I also considered how best to utilize the online setting to enhance my curriculum. Um, during the semester, you know, I considered ways in which I could improve the use of our discussion forum um, to engage student participation, you know, and, and on reflection, at the end of the semester, I considered the ways in which online instruction uh, changed discussion as well as in-class activities. Uh, now, I found that online instruct instruction was advantageous to my curriculum and research in a number of ways. Um, for one, it pushed me to test these materials in a new forum, which was in itself beneficial. Um, and as a result, I realized that online instruction could extend these lessons globally. Um, so students could potentially engage with the materials from anywhere which would help to broaden the conversation and expand peaceful dialogue. Um, 
In this case, the online setting offers the opportunity to extend my curriculum beyond the classroom even and potentially share it in other online forums um, where participants can take part from, from anywhere. Um, now, since we were using Blackboard Collaborate, I was able to utilize breakout groups to facilitate interaction between students. Um, the app WeChat is, is hugely popular in China. So this also proved to be a, a useful tool for announcements and document sharing. Um, I actually found that at times breakout groups encouraged conversation as I would enter the various rooms to check in on students and, and, and ask questions. Um, I also found that some students seemed more comfortable to share their ideas from behind a computer screen, which I found interesting. Um, however, this, this did not come without its challenges, of course. Um, I, found it, I found it difficult to create, or I suppose replicate the, the kind of traditional classroom community. Um, for instance, many of the more introverted students remained silent throughout group discussions to the point where I would have to cold call in the chat to get their attention or make announcements in our WeChat group. Um, though I, I often find that the best way to engage the, the more passive students is really by giving them the opportunity to talk in pairs first um, and then share their ideas in larger groups or with the class. So I often utilize this think pair share method rather than cold calling. Um, I also integrated more videos and online resources than I had in previous semesters, um, which students responded well to. Uh, for instance, I would have them come up with their own discussion questions based on a video clip they watched on their own during the week. They would then respond to those questions as a group during class. Um, and this gave them plenty of time to consider the subject and, and their responses. Um, the discussion forum, though, proved to be the most influential addition to my courses, I would say. Um, each week, students were to engage in an online discussion forum where they would post an initial response to a weekly question and maintain conversation on that subject throughout the week. Um, I would respond to students as well to ensure that conversation remains structured and on track. Um, and over the course of the semester, I also altered discussion questions in response to global news updates surrounding the, the pandemic, which I found useful as well. Um, this gave students the opportunity to consider the ways that, as that they as designers could respond to global crisis again. Um, for instance, for one of our discussion question postings, I asked students to consider the various reactions to COVID-19 in the United States. Um, I then asked if you were a designer in the US, how could you respond to this kind of divide that we're witnessing between Americans as a result of the pandemic? Um, and student responses varied. <laughs> However, some noted that they would take an informative approach by relaying medical information about the virus. Um, while other, others wanted to find ways of establishing mutual understanding through interactive design um, to kind of give the public a chance to share differing perspectives. Um, some, for instance, proposed apps that would allow for fruitful exchange while discouraging any unproductive or combative discourse. So I, I was impressed and intrigued by some of their reactions to um, to some of these discussion questions. Um, but overall, I find our class discussions to be more abundant and rewarding in the physical classroom. Uh, however, giving students the opportunity to share their ideas in a written discussion forum really did add a new layer of depth and thoughtfulness to our discussions. Um, so this is actually a tool that I continue to use in the physical classroom. Um, so it's kind of had this residual effect, though assigned postings are less frequent. Um, and apart from, from oral and written discussion, the online platform and the pandemic 
also altered some of our in-class activities. Um, in certain ways, I would argue for, for the better as well. Uh, for instance, one of the activities that I originally created to align with this, again, kind of unconventional peace building model, um, which I then adapted to suit design specific English in my design classes was further altered for the online setting. However, I found this beneficial. Um, since adapted to suit my, my design classes, uh, the activity is to first teach students the target design vocabulary for the lesson. Um, students then discuss various countries that they would like to visit, explaining why they wanna go there. Um, students first discuss in pairs and then share their commentary with the class. Um, they then individually create an advertisement about the country that they hope to visit. Now, the advertisement must include images, descriptive language, and the target vocabulary. Um, and students then research the country of their choice and add five new facts that they, they didn't know about their advertisement um, or about that country. Students then create a sales pitch for why classmates should visit the country while explaining um, personal interest in, in that country as part of the, the kind of storytelling component. Um, and finally, everyone chooses one of the presented countries to visit and writes an imaginary journal entry about a day in that country from his or her perspective based on everything learned from the presenter. Um, so the English language outcome of this activity is for students to demonstrate effective presentation skills. Um, the design outcome is for students to exhibit a successful advertisement. Um, and the peace building outcome is that students will display a newfound understanding of the country of, of their choice. So I would like to take this lesson um, further and give students the opportunity to actually interview individuals from their chosen countries. Um, and the online platform certainly makes this a, a real possibility and, and something that can be integrated into the, the physical classroom. Um, mostly for this activity, the, the physical classroom was mirrored by Blackboard in that students use the breakout rooms for discussion. Um, I used the whiteboard function to teach the target vocabulary. And otherwise, students use their computers for research as they would in class. Um, while I've noted that there are, are benefits and disadvantages to using Blackboard uh, in presenting their advertisements, the platform actually made for a seamless transition between presentations, which was kind of nice, given, given that students could simply share their screens one after another, um, which I just appreciated from the teacher's perspective. <laughs> um, and, and now going forward, I'm, I'm still processing what students and I have learned from the online experience. Um, again, I'm still kind of integrating some of what I've learned into the physical classroom. Um, and and I'm, I'm still learning as a whole to use this information to enhance my, my physical classes, essentially. Um, but in, in other words, I'm now kind of inferring and, and continuing to experiment with materials to combine all that I've learned from this experience with my previous curriculum. Um, so this study is a, a work in progress as I move forward with my research and course development. Um, yeah, I keep hitting the wrong mute and unmute button. <laughs> <laughs> All right, th thank you, Kira. Um, it was a wonderful look both at um, narrative peace building pedagogy across a couple different disciplines and across two different ways of teaching. Um, appreciate that. All right, so I'm going to keep moving on. Mine should be a bit shorter, so we'll still have some time for discussion at the end. But first, I'm going to
click share screen and you can tell me if this is working right. Yes. All right. Yep. Yeah, we can see it, Gabe. Okay, great. And There we go. So now she'll have to. Okay. Wonderful. And now, since I'm using my computer screen for the slideshow, I'll be looking on my phone for my script. And this basically, I'm looking at a Grim Brothers fairy tale. Um, Called Godfather Death, and or the Grim Brother Brothers version of the fairy tale, and walking through that because um, I find that sometimes thinking through traditional stories and drawing parallels to contemporary events gives us the opportunity to sort of think or tackle with issues in a different way, and in this case, in a more narrative way. Let's get started. So, reading the Grimm's Godfather Death in the Shadow of COVID-19. So the fairy tale starts with a poor father looking for someone to serve as godfather for his infant son. He is a poor man with many children, so financial support from a godparent is the man's best hope for looking after his youngest child's needs. Think of it as the 19th century equivalent of running a GoFundMe campaign to pay for your medical treatment. First, God approaches and offers to serve as Godfather. God doesn't meet the latter's standards. The new father complains, give to the poor and let the rich starve. Or, sorry, you give to the rich and let the poor starve. I got that backwards there. Now, the bourgeois, bourgeois Grimm's appended this disclaimer. Thus spoke the man, for he did not know how wisely God divides out wealth and poverty. So, replace God with Adam Smith's invisible hand. This line could have come from an economics textbook written by an orthodox capitalist, many of whom have indeed replaced God with the invisible hand. So, this editorial interjection at the very beginning of the story is the first place I find a parallel with our COVID-19 pandemic. So you see, I spent about half of this year without an Amazon Prime subscription. Then I wanted to watch the NBA Commissioner's Cups. I'm going too fast. Then I wanted to watch the WNBA Commissioner Cups game, Commissioner's Cup game, and that was that. But I made the decision to cancel my subscription in late March 2020 after Amazon fired Chris Small, warehouse worker who led a strike protesting unsafe working conditions. Shortly thereafter, leaked meeting notes revealed that Amazon senior vice president and general counsel David Sapolsky advised he's not smart or articulate. And to the extent the press want to focus on us versus him, we will be in a much stronger position than simply explaining for the umpteenth time how we're trying to protect the workers. Now, Zapolsky was able to self-isolate and work remotely. He was clearly convinced, though, that his perspective was superior to that of someone in the trenches with their life at risk. This white-collar disdain for the person and concerns of a blue-collar laborer uncomfortably echoes the Grimm Brothers' editorial rebuke of the poor father's criticism of poverty and inequality. Let me just add that pre-COVID, Amazon considered Chris Small sufficiently smart and articulate to put him in charge of training new warehouse workers. So he was clearly smart enough to be given that responsibility now, I'll also add that Mr. Small is African-American, whereas Mr. Zapolsky is white, but I'll let you decide for yourself whether the latter's remarks carry any trace of implicit bias. Also, according to 
an April 2021 Bloomberg News article, Mr. Zapolsky's total compensation from Amazon for 2020 was $17.2 million. Meanwhile, in June 2021, New York Times expose of Minister Small's former warehouse reads like something out of a dystopian novel. We barely got into the fairy tale, though, just as we had barely gotten into the pandemic when Chris Smalls was fired, so let's continue. Following the poor man's rebuff of God, the devil approaches and offers to serve as Godfather. The man doesn't approve of the devil either. Complaining, you deceive mankind and leave them and lead them astray. Like anti-vax propaganda. Since this rebuke challenged neither the Grimm's piety nor the prevailing socioeconomic order, this time they felt no need to editorialize. Finally, death approaches, declaring, I am death who makes everyone equal. This sounds much better to the poor father, who replies, you are the right one. You take away the rich as well as the poor, without distinction. You shall be my child's godfather. This is an interesting thought. Everyone dies, but death should be fair. No one should be put at unreasonably greater risk than anyone else. We've fallen short of this during the COVID-19 pandemic, both pre- and post-vaccine. Pre-vaccine, blue-collar workers and medical workers were disproportionately affected. Over the past several months, there have been numerous headlines about restaurants struggling to find employees but food service was one of the heaviest hit industries. We have over 700,000 COVID, 700, COVID deaths in the United States alone. Many of those former food service workers aren't return, returning to the job force, to the workforce, because they're dead. Others aren't returning because they've seen too much death. Also, due to legacy structures of racism, people of color are particularly concentrated in the affected industries, and thus were especially hard hit in 2020. Post-vaccine, the inequity is global rather than local. At this point, anyone in the United States who wants to get the vaccine can do so, and for free. Vaccination rates are now suppressed by politically motivated misinformation resulting in a 2021 remapping of who was hardest hit. The global situation, however, is different. I'm sure we all remember the headlines from earlier this year about how hard India was being hit because they didn't have access to enough vaccines. And a couple months back, I saw a chart of global vaccination rates with the highest rates in blue and lowest in red. All of Africa, shades of pink and red. That wasn't due to resistance, it was due to unavailability. While well, vaccine distribution prioritized the so-called first world, formerly colonized nations had to wait while they were ravished by the disease. This is not the justice promised by the fairy tale where death treats everyone equally. But the fairy tale, as it turns out, has a response to this. When the son grows up, he becomes a doctor. That sets him up in the profession by giving him a medicine that can cure anyone who is curable. He warns the young doctor, though, not to administer treatment if death waits by the foot of the bed. The godson breaks this rule twice, first for a king and next for a princess. Each time he has the sick bed turned around so that death is by the head of the bed, not the foot. Now, death lets the godson off with a warning the first time, but the second time, the consequences are more severe. Now, you right, might remember that on, in October of 2020, a certain world leader came down with COVID-19, a leader who had repeatedly encouraged large gatherings in the service of his re-election campaign, recklessly putting himself and others at risk. Sorry, just lost my spot. There we go. This leader then received an experimental treatment not available to the general public. Now, I don't begrudge this man his life, 
But here we have another echo of the fairy tale. The same medical treatment should be available to everyone. Death is clear on that, but the young doctor bends the rules for the wealthy and powerful. So what happens after the godson's second offense? Well, death drags him down into an underground cavern filled with innumerable candles. Each candle represents a human life. Then death points to one candle, nearly burnt out, which he explains in the doctor's own candle. The godson begs his godfather to light him a new candle, thus extending his life. But the story closes with this. Death pretended that he was going to fulfill this wish and to hold a large new candle. But desiring revenge, he purposely made a mistake in relighting it, and the little piece fell down and went out. The physician immediately fell to the ground, and he too was now in the hands of death. So that is the fairy tale warning. As a teller of parables once declared, let those with ears to hear, hear. And I'll stop sharing at that point so that that's the end of my presentation. And we now have about 25 minutes left for discussion. So let's um, open it up. I see a, looks like a hand from uh, Dave Riley. So why don't so you start us off, Dave? Go ahead and unmute so we can hear you. Hi, I, that was actually just applause. I appreciated your presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you, I, pr I appreciate that. So, um, so yeah, any, any comments or questions about any of our presentations, the, the floor is now open. Um, people who are on, Zoom, go ahead, unmute if you have anything to say, and um, people who are in the room live, hopefully there's a, a microphone or something there so that you can you know, come up or just maybe come up to Michael's computer if you have something you want to say or ask. Ah. Michael saying we're able to send questions via the chat. Perfect. Perfect. So I'll pop the chat open and and perhaps I'll get. Things are well. Oh, here we go. Ah, here's a so here's the first question. I'll toss this out to everyone on the panel. Um, there's a question here about how the larger COVID reality has changed the politics of self, specifically how people understand their own role in the community and family. So. Um, yeah. Kirk, how about we toss that to you first and thoughts on that, and then maybe here we can get your thoughts on that same question after that. How's that sound? Mm -hmm. Open a follow-up to quote the person in the room. How did slash does COVID change how we understand stand ourselves to be part of or outside of community, communities of health of death? Right. Um, well, I I don't think COVID changed anything. I think it really just revealed who we are. Um, you know, we live, especially in our American context, we, we live in a highly individualistic society. At times that we forget that we are a country, we are a community, right? And, you know, the notion of individual rights um, in a lot of individuals' eyes supersedes the overall good of the whole, right? Um, and that comes with, of course, 
um, even though it shouldn't be controversial, but the controversies of vaccination, right? And how, unfortunately, um, many mechanisms, including social media, um, not understanding and sorting out and sifting through adequate scientific information, um, and also the mistrust of um, the medical establishment, right? Um, all of these things lead to, of course, what we're dealing with now. But I don't think, uh, I don't think COVID nineteen changed anything. I think it really revealed a lot of things that were under our noses. It, it, it really ris a lot, risen a lot of things to the surface, right? So things like poverty, things like economics um, regarding um, the wealth gap. Um, worker instability. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So I honestly don't think um, COVID changed perceptions of self. It really just showed and revealed who we are and how far we have to go in being more communal about understanding that it's not just about me, but that I live in the community. I live in a, not just a community in America, but a global community and I have to do my part. And sometimes, sometimes one's individual liberty should temporarily, right, um, be um, negated for the collective good as a whole, right? So that is my particular response uh, to uh, that really good question. So I'll bring it to my colleagues, uh, Kira and uh, Gabriel. Mm, yeah, thank you, Kirk. Um, yeah, for me, it uh, it actually makes me think of my students and how they kind of in, engage uh, with the outside community, or I guess the community outside of, of school now. I mean, the other day I had a student come to me and tell me that he's really excited because he wants to transfer to Oxford next semester, but he's terrified to go abroad. He, he, he doesn't feel... Uh, comfortable leaving China, given especially the, the, the recent attacks in the UK, he, he, he feels like it might not be um, worth going. So we kind of had a long talk about that. Um, so I think this, this question is, is really interesting in considering um, the ways that, that students, especially here in, in China, are now um, feeling isolated from the outside world, essentially, um, or at least that's what I'm getting from from some of them, particularly from this one student. Um, he does still plan to go, <laughs> um, but he, you know he 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 has his his reservations. So again, we had a, a long talk about that. Um, but yeah, thank you for this this question. And interesting work, and I think we're all answering the question. It, I guess you could say different scales, if you will, because of course, Kirk sort of addressed his answer to the national scale, Kira to the global scale, and um, you know, my thoughts sort of, you know, particularly honing in on the community and families, uh, Kirk and Kira know. Um, I moved from New Jersey back to my home state of Oregon um, almost a year ago now, and so sort of been immersed in family life. But you know, because I have three nephews who are all too young to get vaccinated, you know, with Delta variant, et cetera, were we all all still somewhat in the bubble, so to speak. And so it's become, how can I say it, those local family ties have become more emphasized, if that makes sense, um, where, you know, they're still keeping in touch, interacting, you know, through Zoom, you know, through the screen with the rest of the world, but it's become a bit you know, more insular, almost a, a little bit of a family island, if you will. And, but I do think it's 
interesting what Kirk had to say about, you know, is this changing things or is this, you know, revealing what was already there, you know, and in this case, revealing, I guess you could say that, you know, we do have, you know, at least in my, you know, local family here, you know, important family, family ties to fall back on. Um, so that's, that's my thought. And, it, and we have a, a follow-up uh, for Kira. And for Kira, I'm summarizing the question here. In the online learning environment, what are your thoughts on how the pandemic has permanently changed educators and students' expectations of what education is, what professors are expected to do? In your view, have we made global changes which we will not come back from? Is this Zoomification a form of disaster capitalism? The system accommodating change as best it can, a third option. Yeah, this is a, a great question. Um, so I, I really, I think, um, I think now instructors are expected to be more dynamic. Um, I think that there is a, a certain expectation for us to, to maybe even adapt more, more quickly with um, ongoing changes as a result of, of the pandemic. Um, I mean, I was just talking with my dissertation committee the other day, actually, um, and one of my, my mentors was, was um, you know, telling me the, the challenges that she, she's faced in, in adapting to this new learning environment after 30 years of teaching. Um, and, you know, she was saying how, how she had never even taught on, online before. I hadn't taught online before. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, we have that week, most of us, right, we have a week to, to suddenly prepare for this online semester. And many of us did not have the experience to, to do that. Um, but we had, we had to make it happen. That was the expectation. Um, and, and even now, I mean, our, our role has, has, has kind of shifted. I know I still have students or, or here at WKU, we have students coming in mid-semester just to, to begin their, their semester coursework. So we're actually creating mid-semester courses for these, these students. Um, we have, I know at the, the beginning of the semester for a, a few weeks, um, you know, I had to record my, my classes and upload them to Blackboard as if we were still online because of course there were still students in quarantine. Um, so yeah, I think that we, I think there's an expectation for us to adapt quickly um, and, and, and to, to keep up essentially. Um, and also I know for, for me being here in China and normally it's kind of a, a unique experience too then um, because normally I would go home, to, come home to the United States for summers and, and, and winter vacation. Um, but now, you know, I'm expected to, to stay here. My job is totally different. What, you know, when I, I signed up for, for this, I was here half, half the year. Um, so now even that, that role looks looks a little bit different where I, I can't really go home. If I do, it's a month long quarantine to, to get back here. Um, so I know professors here are experiencing kind of the shift in lifestyle and, and what we're used to, especially as expats um, with the freedom to sort of move, move around. It's part of what, what draws you to this, this profession. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think this is a, a, a Great question. I don't know if um, if if Kirk or, or Gabe want to to chime in on this, um, but thank you. Yeah, and I think you know I left my I taught uh, before Kira arrived there for a year at WKU and then at King University in the United States for a little over two and a half years. 
as a lecturer and left at the um, end of August 2020. But so for that spring and summer, I was, you know, teaching online. I'd done some online teaching before that to develop the online version of the world literature course. So I had that kind of in my back pocket, that experience in my back pocket. So I was able to shift a little more easily than some others. But I think I noticed, you know, two things. One, it, I think, accelerated the shift to from some faculty having online pedagogy skills to pretty much all faculty having to develop them. Mm -hmm. So I had always incorporated either a Blackboard or Moodle element into all my courses, basically from the time I started teaching as an adjunct from, for Caldwell University back in 2014. Um, but you know there you know now we have pretty much everyone has had to develop those skills and has some experience in the area. But the other side of that is I think particularly among some administrators, there had been this online education as magic bullet thinking prior to the pandemic this idea that, oh, once we finally get, you know, all those, all the Luddite faculty on board, you know, online education is the future and it'll be magical and we'll have students from everywhere. And what we've learned, I think during the pandemic is that a lot of students have a, strong preference for at least some of their learning being in person. Um, and I think that's one reason why sometimes too quickly and unsafely you've had campuses push to go live is that we've learned that the in-person experience is always going to be part of the educational ecosystem because the appetite for fully online learning is smaller than some people have been assuming. Does that, does that make sense? So I think we've both expanded capacity in terms of skill building and we've learned that there are some hard limits in terms of, you know, the, what the consumer base wants. Mm -hmm. um, and I see one more in the chat. And this one, it looks like it's primarily directed at Kirk. Uh, it says, for Kirk, though anyone can respond, have you found other scholars work on necropolitics? Like, um, Membe, and I apologize if I mispronounced that, M-B-E-M-B-E, -E -E. Membe, is that right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Useful in thinking through your questions. How is what you're seeing different or the same from Membe, Foucault, or others who wrote about biopolitics slash necropolitics and the ability of state power to dictate who can live and who can die? Yeah. Um... I don't think uh, it's anything different. Uh, what's so interesting is how we see history continue to repeat itself um, uh, and reinvent itself or reify itself, but the premise is still the same regarding politics and power, right? So um, in regards to what I talked about with COVID-19, and um, again, of course, the racial habitats of Asian and Pacific Islanders, right? Um, this is, you know, that's why specifically I went through the history because this is nothing new within our American context. So to use um, Foucault regarding, you know, the clinical gaze, right? The looking down on individuals, right? 
um, that is very much part of the American psyche um, in regards to the other, you know, those who individuals who are deemed as the other, you know, immigrants in uh, communities um, or people of color um, and indigenous individuals as well. So I guess the solution, because of course we could talk about the problems is rethinking race as again, of course, a social and politi uh, political construct, but also um, reshaping our politics and in, in saying, okay, we have done these groups of individuals harm what are some forms of restitution legally and politically we could think of to, um, to alleviate that history? And unfortunately, we're not even at that point, right? Um, in order for you to have a, you know, to fix a problem, you have to acknowledge the problem exists. And we still are not acknowledging racism in our country. It's still that denial phase. So until we overcome that, um, we're still going to have, you know, this cyclical history of oppression for different communities of color or marginalized communities. Um, and to um, quickly, just to piggyback off of what Gabe and Kira said, and I know that Dave has his hand up, so I'll be quick here. Um, we also have to be careful with Zoomification regarding pedagogy, regarding students, because I notice a lot of students do very well in online learning. A lot of students do not do very well with online learning because everyone learns differently. So we also have to be mindful. Uh, yes, Zoom does have its place and it could be convenient and could be a useful tool, but regarding the social mechanism within meeting in person, which students definitely need being in quarantine for so long and looking at a computer screen all day, that's another element that we need to consider. So not being over Zoomified, if you will, um, but having that healthy balance. So I also wanted to uh, comment on that as well, but I know Dave had his hand up, so. No, I, it, I'm interested to hear that specifically because it ties into, I think, in some ways what I was going to ask, which is um, a, a comment that you made earlier, Kirk, about the opportunity to talk about communalism and, and the need to subordinate individualism for the for the larger interest. Um, and, and I agree with that entirely, and, and, and that has been my approach in the classroom, thinking about it as teachable moments in the way that Gabe demonstrated through his as well. I also see, though, that there is a, a, a dichotomization of this. And at some level, what we see is a, a physical opportunity for students to express their rejection of, of that communalism by the way they wear their masks in a class, by the way they respond to that kind of discussion about our sort of personal responsibility. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Um, for me, you know, part of it is that we're, we're at a moment in higher education where we see opportunities not only to advance peace and justice in really meaningful ways by the way we approach this specific question, but also the validity of what we do as a scientific, as a, 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 as a contemplative process, rather than relying on a sort of jumble of, of opinions that end up taking precedent in this social media experience. And I guess to connect it to Kira as well, I'm curious if that same kind of dynamic exists at an international level. And if there is that kind of, um, on the one hand, this interest for the common good, as opposed to this individualism, hyper individualism and a rejection of all of that. Right. I, um, I digress to uh, Kira, so she has the opportunity to speak and then I'll uh, respond afterwards. I might need a second to think, think too, actually. So do you want me to go real quick and then? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so quickly, um, I think that, um, again, there is a, it is, it's a dualism, right? There's a, a dichotomy here. I think one way we could start is rethinking, and this is a huge issue, uh, rethinking, or should I say decolonizing curricula, right? Which is so centered and Eurocentric that it kind of negates the learning and individualism of students, particularly students of color. Um, so I think also part of that process within our classes, within our syllabi, right, is incorporating more diversity and more diverse thinking from many different backgrounds, which creates a more holistic um, perception um, and really helps students of color um, emphasize uh, their individualism within the classroom. 
So that's one particular, there's many different ways, but that's one particular way I think that we could really help um, in, in the communal good, if you will. Um, so I'll stop there because I know it's 11 a.m. and I want Kira to, um, or 11 a.m. my time, excuse me, I'm on the East Coast. Uh, but go ahead, Kira. Yeah, um, well, I think that this is, is part of what I'm, I'm trying to, to do in my, my own courses. Um, in, in just sort of getting students to share their own in individual perspectives on, again, global issues and things like this, um, but to also uh, listen closely, to, 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 um, to give their classmates the opportunity to speak and, and, and um, share as well. There's, there's 56 different ethnic groups in China, um, so, you might be surprised at how diverse some of our classes can be too. Um, so just giving each of those students, you know, the platform to to share their own personal experiences, I think helps to, to create this um, kind of um, community mindset as, as well. Yeah. Is this Gabe, did you want to add to this? Um. Just to say, actually, I think, I think that's probably a good a good place for for us to end. It's it's right about right about time. Oh, see Michael saying in the comments, thank you all. Lots of heads nodding. I'm so to to the people who are both the people who are here on Zoom and who joined us from Milwaukee. Thank you for for joining us on this panel. And I think that's that's a good place to close and let everyone get to the, the break before the next session. <laughs>